Welcome to Haunted Talks, the official podcast of The Haunted Walk, offering thematic walking tours and paranormal adventures in Kingston, Ottawa, and Toronto, Ontario. My name is Jim Dean, I am the creative director, and I really appreciate you joining us for today's show. Imagine waking up in the middle of the night to discover a strange man standing in your bedroom brandishing an axe. It sounds like something from the plot of a slasher film, but for the people of New Orleans in the early 1900s, this was no fictional plot. The city was being terrorized. A deranged monster was repetitively breaking into the homes of Italian grocers. The unsuspecting victims, including children, were maimed or murdered as they slept. As the number of victims grew, so did the apprehension in the city and the pressure on the police to bring the killer to justice. Today, we look at one of the great cold cases in American history, the Axeman of New Orleans. But before we get to that, As I announced on the show last week, tickets for our Halloween season are now vanishing. That's right, our Halloween tickets are up for sale, and the Halloween season this year is going to run September 28th to November 3rd in Kingston, Ottawa, and Toronto. And of course, it is our favorite time of year, and we have just a whole slew of tours and paranormal fun to get up to during that time. Now, I'd like to highlight a couple this week. And in each city, we have our classic city tour, which is the original Haunted Walk of Ottawa or Kingston, Toronto. But during our Halloween season, we're going to be offering special premium versions of the original Haunted Walk of Ottawa and the original Haunted Walk of Toronto. Now, these special premium tours will feature smaller groups, a longer duration, closer to two hours compared to an hour and a half on the standard version. And we'll also include a visit inside one of the most haunted buildings in each city. In Ottawa, we will be going inside the Bytown Museum, a place where I've had a bit of an encounter myself, as well as Mackenzie House in Toronto on the original Haunted Walk there. Certainly a very active site in Toronto as well. Tickets for both of these premium experiences and all of our Halloween season tickets are available on our website, which is hauntedwalk.com. And we hope we are part of your plans this fall. Earlier this month, we threw down the 55-star review challenge on Apple Podcasts. And I'm happy to say that number we got keeps climbing and climbing. I think we're at 40 now. So just we need 10 people left, one day to do it. If you haven't had a chance to review the show yet on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to us, certainly now is the time to do it so we can hit that goal. We would also love to connect with you on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all at Haunted Walk, getting just a great variety of photos in particular from our customers and our tour guides out having fun on their adventures. And it's a great way to get a little sample of what it's like to be on a Haunted Walk. Joining us to discuss this captivating and gruesome case is Miriam C. Davis, author of Axeman of New Orleans, The True Story. The Axeman began in August of 1910 and attacked again in September, a month later, and then attacked again. And and this was the first fatality in June of 1911. He disappears for about six years. He returns in December of 1917, and this is an attack that's not widely known, but because it's not fatal, he attacks an Italian grocer and his family. One of the things that I noted is that the Axeman's attacks became more lethal over time. It's almost like he's starting out kind of hesitantly and sort of just discovering that he likes this. And it's not until the third attack that he achieves a fatality. 
But starting with the Maggio attack in May of 1919, there are always fatalities. I mean, he becomes much more lethal. In the early morning hours of May 23rd, 1918, Joseph and Catherine Maggio were savagely murdered in their bedroom. The amount of blood was staggering, even to veteran police officers, with splatter reaching up to seven feet on the walls. Joseph was found lying on the bed with his feet hanging off the side. Catherine was found on the floor at his feet. In the bathroom, a bloody axe, taken from their backyard, was found in the tub. After an autopsy was performed, it was determined that both victims had had their throats cut, and in addition, Joseph had been hit twice with an axe, fracturing his skull. While Catherine had not been hit with the axe, the cut to her throat was so deep it came close to decapitating her, making it likely she was drowning in her own blood while also bleeding to death. The bloody razor was discarded on the lawn of the next door neighbor. While a small bit of money was taken, more valuable items, such as Catherine's jewelry, were left untouched in plain sight. In August of 1918, he attacks a man named Joseph Romano. And then March of 1919, he attacks a family, Charlie Rosie and Mary Cordomiglia. And he kills little Mary Cordomiglia, who's a toddler of about two years old. Then he leaves New Orleans, I believe. There are other attacks that, that some people attribute to the Axeman, but I don't think the Axeman is responsible for. But he hits elsewhere in Louisiana. In 1920 and 1921, there are three other attacks on Italian grocers in Alexandria, Louisiana, in Lake Charles, and in DeRitter that are very much like these attacks in New Orleans. And so I think they're also attributable to the Axeman. The attacks involving the Axeman did seem to follow a particular pattern. They are on Italian corner groceries, you know, these small family groceries that are found almost in every corner um, in New Orleans at the time, where the family lives in the back, attacks in the middle of the night from one to three in the morning, usually on a moonless night, usually with the family's own axe. He becomes famous for sort of prying off the door panel and reaching in to slip the bolt. But in fact, he comes in any any way that's easy. He'll come in an open window or something like that. And he usually seems to go for the the mail. Other people are injured, but it seems that he's going for, for the grocer. Some money was taken. Sometimes a small amount of cash would be taken, but valuable jewelry would be left. Sometimes nothing was taken. But the police pretty quickly determined that a burglary was not the main object of the, the break-in. As for the weapon of choice, why an axe? Everybody had an axe because um, people used wood-burning stoves. So he could count on everybody have an axe on the premises. He could use the axe and then leave it, and he wouldn't have the danger of having to steal an implement to use. He wouldn't have the danger of carrying a bloody instrument through the streets afterwards, because even in New Orleans, if you walk through the streets with a bloody axe or cleaver at three in the morning, this is going to raise eyebrows. As some of the victims did survive their encounter with the axe man, were they able to provide an eyewitness description to the police? At the beginning, certainly, we have descriptions of what he looked like, particularly with Mrs. Crutie, the wife of the first Axeman victim. So we know he was a white man. He wasn't Italian. We know he was probably working class because he was dressed in the kind of clothes a working man would, would wear. Later, it becomes much harder for anybody to say definitely anything about the Axeman because he does become more lethal and, and people really, I think, are more frightened because of the severity of the attacks. We do have a woman in 1918 who sees him and says, you know, she, she thinks he was a white man. Our most reliable eyewitness identifications are sort of early on in his series of attacks. Today, when we think about crime scene investigations, we often think about things we may have seen 
on TV or in the movies, the CSI franchise, for example. But what forensic evidence did the police department have at that time that they could use to try to catch the killer? Well, they had almost none of the techniques that we see the police using today. They, the police in New Orleans did not even use fingerprints until about 1918. And even if they had fingerprints from a particular crime scene, they had to have an individual to test them against because there was no database. There was nowhere you're running them through a database. Um, they did take photographs. Of, uh, of the crime scenes. And one of my great disappointments was I was never able to find the police file with the photographs. But they weren't very careful in the way they went through crime scenes, and they weren't very careful about keeping people away from the crime scene. In, in the attack on the Cordomiglia family in March of 1919, the local sheriff, trying to be helpful, nailed uh, the door panel back to the door right after the attack. A lot of times you find that the police are not searching the area uh, around the site of the attack, like in, in vacant fields next, next door. They're not searching that until several days after the attack. They don't have the tools, really, that make it necessary to preserve the crime scene the way it's done today. They didn't have much experience with these sorts of crimes. That I've read that police say, and even defense lawyers will say, that you know the most obvious suspect is usually the guilty party. And while the police probably convicted a lot of innocent people doing this, they also probably got a lot of guilty people by just assuming the most obvious a suspect is guilty. And they would just sort of question them, often using the third degree until until they confessed, or at least until the police claim they confessed. That's kind of the rough and ready way that they had of going about solving crimes at the beginning of the, of the 20th century because they expected people to commit crimes for obvious motives. Greed, you know, robbing somebody, passion, you know, getting angry at your spouse and picking up the nearest kitchen knife and stabbing them. Those kinds of crimes were what they usually dealt with. This kind of crime where there's no obvious connection between the victim and the murderer, even today, is, is hard to solve. And so at that time, with, with so few of the scientific techniques and the investigative techniques that we have today, you know, they'd have practically had to have caught the ax man walking out of a grocer's at three in the morning holding a bloody ax. The term serial killer, as you probably know, didn't come into use until something like the 1970s. And the only serial killer any of most people would have ever heard of, even though there were serial killers in, in the United States in, in the 19th century, most people would have only heard of like Jack the Ripper. So it was, it was kind of an unusual idea. And so it became easy for the press, you know, for other people to attribute it either to just robberies that had gone wrong or to what they call the mafia. You know, a, a lot of crimes involving Italians just sort of automatically, reflexively get attributed to the mafia, this mysterious organization, which you know a lot of people think existed and could basically be used to explain any crime involving, involving Italians. How was the community responding to these attacks? I have to imagine there was some fear and panic. After the Romano attack at the end of the summer in 1918, and you have to remember, this is after... The Andalina attack at the end of 1917, the very gruesome Maggio attack in, in May, and then the Bessemer attack the next month, which I don't think was an Axeman attack, but a lot of people did because it was an attack on a grocer in a grocery store. So after the Romano attack, there was this kind of real fear. And I think particularly among the Italian community who, who felt that they were the victims, they were the primary victims of this killer. I mean, I think the average person who didn't run a grocery store, in particular sort of higher up on the socioeconomic scale, I think it might have made them a bit nervous. But I don't think the fear was anything like that that you see in the Italian community where you have stories of you know, men staying up all night with shotguns guarding their families. One of the strangest elements of the Axeman case has to do with a letter that was published in a local paper on March 19, 1919, from an individual claiming to be the Axeman. I'd like to read it. 
It's dated hell, March 13th, 1919. Esteemed mortal of New Orleans, they have never caught me and they never will. They have never seen me for I am invisible. Even as the ether that surrounds your earth, I am not a human being, but a spirit and a demon from the hottest hell. I am what you Orleanians and your foolish police call the Axe Man. When I see fit, I shall come and claim other victims. I alone know whom they shall be. I shall leave no clue except my bloody axe, be smeared with the blood and brains of he whom I have sent below to keep me company. If you wish, you may tell the police to be careful not to rile me. Of course, I am a reasonable spirit. I take no offense at the way they have conducted their investigations in the past. In fact, they have been so utterly stupid as to not only amuse me, but his satanic majesty. But tell them to beware. Let them not try to discover what I am, for it were better that they were never born than to incur the wrath of the Axe Man. I don't think there is any need of such a warning, for I feel sure the police will always dodge me, as they always have in the past. They are wise and know how to keep away from all harm. Undoubtedly, you Orleanians think of me as a most horrible murderer, which I am but I could also be much worse if I wanted to. If I wished, I could pay a visit to the city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best and the worst, for I am in close relationship with the angel of death. Now to be exact, at 12.15 earthly time, on next Tuesday night, I'm going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I'm going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils and the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well, then, so much the better for you people. One thing is certain, and that is that some of your people who do not jazz it out on that specific Tuesday night if there be any, we'll get the axe. Well, as I am cold and crave the warmth of my native Tartarus, it is about time I leave your earthly home. I will cease my discourse, hoping that thou wilt publish this, that it may go well with thee. I have been, am, and will be the worst spirit that ever existed, either in fact or realm of fancy. A letter to the Times-Picayune, if people have heard of the Axeman case at all, it's usually this aspect of the case they've heard about. I mean, this gave rise to the the story in the third season of American Horror, when you have the Axeman played as this, you know, trumpet-playing, jazz-loving serial killer. And what happened is, about a week after the attack on the Court of Miglios, the Times-Picayune publishes a letter that purports to be from the Axeman. And, you know, he says, you know, from hell, and he claims to be a a fell demon from the hottest hell. And he says that the next Tuesday night, and the letter's published on Sunday, he says the next Tuesday night, he will be walking around New Orleans looking for victims. And any residence, any place from which jazz is playing, those people will be safe. And when I talked to the homicide detective and I talked to the profiler, they didn't think that this was written by by the killer. I mean, first of all, the person who wrote this letter is an educated person. There's a classical allusion to Tartarus. It is extremely well written. And, you know, we have evidence from eyewitness accounts that this person is probably of working class origins. And at that time, a person of working class origins really wouldn't be very well educated and, and wouldn't be capable of writing such a letter. You know, I've read like the Jack the Ripper letters, and I've read other serial killer letters like BTK, and it just has a different feel to it to me. And if you read this letter, to me, it kind of has the feel of sort of a a fraternity prank. So I don't think it was written by the killer. The most likely suspect, in my view, and you cannot libel the dead, so I'm on safe ground here and just speculating. Soon after the letter came out, there was all this buzz about the, the serial killer 
you know, wanting to people to play jazz. A local songwriter named John Joseph Davila comes out with a jazz song called The Mysterious Axeman's Jazz. And he makes an absolute, you know, packet off of this. And when I told the homicide detective that I was consulting about this, he looks at me and he says, he done it. I mean, he, he just thought immediately that the, the songwriter had a motive for doing this. And I actually think whoever did it meant it as a joke. And in fact, a lot of people, sort of the upper social class in New Orleans, took it as a joke. While, you know, people who were less educated, um, people who perhaps were a bit superstitious, it was those people that it really, really frightened. Here is a small sample of... The Axeman's Jazz. On the night of March 10th, 1919, the Axeman attacked the Cordomiglia family. Charles Cordomiglia and his wife Rosie were seriously injured in the attack, and sadly, their infant daughter, Mary, had been killed. The first to hear the loud screams and arrive on the scene were the neighboring Giordano family, whose history with the Cordomiglia family almost ended with their 17-year-old son, Frank, being wrongly hanged for the crime, and Orlando, the arthritic 69-year-old patriarch, being sentenced to life in prison. The Giordanos were neighbors of the Cortemiglias, and they they were business, also business competitors because they also ran an Italian grocery. They had gone to court with the Cortemiglias a few months earlier over a rental dispute. But it seems, you know, that despite the court case, that they were still on friendly terms. The little girl, Mary Cortemiglia, loved going over to the Giordanos, and, and Frank, 17-year-old Frank, loved playing with the little girl. But because the Giordano family were among the first on the scene, because they were business competitors who had a conflict, I think that's the reason that Sheriff Marrero sort of jumped to the conclusion that they must be guilty. And what, what seems to have happened is when Charlie and Rosie Cordomiglia are taken badly injured to Charity Hospital, the police just badgered them, you know, saying, who did it? Who did it? You know, was it the Giordano's? Did Frank Giordano hit you? You know, like this. And eventually the police claim that the Cordomiglias have identified the Giordano's as their attackers. The problem with this is nobody else heard the Cordomiglias say this. At the trial, Rosie Cordomiglia's doctor testified that up until the time she left the hospital, she told him she couldn't remember anything. When Andy Ojeda, who was a crime reporter, went and interviewed the Cordomiglias after this claim by the police that they had identified their attackers, he found that they just couldn't. And in fact, some reporters found that or Charlie Cordomiglia would just say, agree with anything you asked him. So it's very suspicious to me that only the police in Gretna claimed to have heard the Cortomiglias identify the attackers while they were in the hospital. And what happened with Rosie is that after three weeks in the hospital, she's released by her doctors. She's immediately arrested as a material witness and put in Gretna jail. And she's only released when she signs a document accusing her neighbors. And she testified later that the police basically coerced her and, and threatened her. You know, they wouldn't let her out of jail until she did this. When the case went to trial a few months later, the only real evidence against them was, I mean, Charlie Cortomiglia just couldn't testify. He didn't remember anything. Only Rosie Rosie was the only witness against them. And I think by that time, she had been persuaded that they must have done it because she kept having people tell her that who else would have done it, they must have done it. And her story, I mean, she was a very sympathetic witness. You've got to understand this woman's about 21, 22 years old. She's not well-educated. She's lost her daughter. She's still suffering. You can see, see the effects of the wounds that she suffered from. She makes a very sympathetic witness. But when you look at the court transcript, her testimony doesn't really make sense. And I think that the defense attorney sort of very, very gently kind of tore it apart. 
And the judge seemed to me to be biased against the defense. The defense wanted to offer an alternative theory of the crime. They wanted various victims of the X-Man and the police superintendent of New Orleans to come over and to testify that there in fact was a killer who was going around targeting Italian grocers. And the judge wouldn't let him do that. And so the 69-year-old Orlando Giordano is convicted. He's sentenced to life in prison. By standards of that time, he's a, he's a very old man. He's arthritic. You know, he's not going to survive in prison for very long. His 17-year-old son, Frank, is sentenced to be hanged. But about nine months later, Rosie walks into the office of the Times Picayune and says, St. Joseph came to me in a dream and told me I, I had to tell the truth. You know, I didn't see the Giordanos. I don't know who attacked me. And the only reason Frank had not been hanged was because his case, his conviction, their conviction had been appealed to the Louisiana State Supreme Court. And the next month, the state Supreme Court overturned the conviction, among other grounds, on the grounds that the prosecution had wrongfully withheld potentially exculpatory evidence. But it still takes several months before the prosecution will give up. And in fact, at one point, Rosie is threatened that if she testifies differently in the second trial than she did in the first trial, that she will be prosecuted for perjury. I mean, she comes forward in February of 1920, but it's not until December of 1920 that the Giordanos are released. And I think the reason that Rosie changed her mind is, as I said, I think the police coerced her testimony. I think she had a lot of people telling her they must have done it. You know, who else would have done it? I think she allowed herself to be convinced that they must have been the attacker. But in the aftermath of her daughter's murder and the trial, her marriage fell apart and she ended up moving to New Orleans and she ended up moving away from that constant reinforcement of people telling her, you know, the Giordanas must have done it. After the trial, a Times Picayune reporter named Jim Colton, who was convinced that there was a fiend going around targeting grocers, he went up to Frank Giordano, who was just standing there, just shocked by the verdict, and said, Frank, I will do everything I can to help you. And I think there is circumstantial evidence that Jim Colton tracked down Rosie Cordomiglia and talked to her and persuaded her to come forward and to tell the story of how she was coerced to testify against the Giordano. So I think in the end, you could make the argument that it was Jim Colton who saved Frank Giordano from the, from the gallows. One of the most popular theories is that the Axeman was a fellow named Joseph Mumphrey. Could you explain why many think he is a prime suspect and why your opinion may differ? Most versions of the X-Men story that people are familiar with are kind of a rehash of what a New Orleans writer named Robert Talent had to say in the 1950s. In 1952, Robert Talent wrote a book called Ready to Hang, and in it he had a chapter called The X-Men Wore Wings. And in his version of the story, the only suspect that he suggested was Joseph Mumphrey. And what he said was that people said at the time that the time Mumphrey was in prison and the time that the Axeman struck, when he was out of prison are the periods when the Axeman struck, and that he was murdered in Los Angeles in like 1920 or so by Esther Pepitone, who was the wife of Mike Pepitone, who was believed to be the last of the Axeman's victims. Just to quickly go over that, some people believe the final victim of the Axeman in New Orleans was Mike Pepitone on October 27, 1919. After his death, his widow, Esther, moves to Los Angeles and remarries. What Talent said was that Esther Pepitone said, I saw him kill my husband. He's the Axeman. Now, there's some truth to this story, but talent got it wrong in several respects. First of all, Mike Pepitone was not an Axeman victim. He was killed in the, he was a grocer. He was killed in the middle of the night. He was not attacked with an axe. There were two men 
who were seen at the scene. So he's murdered by two men. He was murdered with a very heavy bar. And there was no attempt made to hit his wife. He was involved in kind of the Italian criminal elements. He had, in fact, left New Orleans a few years earlier because he was afraid of retaliation for something that he and his family had been involved in. When you read the newspaper accounts at the time, the headlines will say something like, police think it might be Axeman attack. Or they, the word Axeman is in the headline, but when you read the story, you'll find out that the police are saying, well, they don't really think it's an Axeman attack. Mumfrey is this low-level, sort of what's called black hand blackmailer. And he goes to prison, in fact, for blowing up an Italian grocery in, a, in an extortion plot. Black hand was a term used to define a kind of extortion racket, typically run by Italians or Italian-Americans. At a most basic level, an individual would go to a business owner or someone with some money and threaten them in some manner, to burn the business down, physical violence, or even death, if they didn't pay X amount of dollars. It is a more direct version of the protection money racket you often see depicted in film and television. It's simply wrong that all of the Axeman attacks occur when he's out of prison, because I found his prison record in Angola. And I can see that there are periods of times when the X-Men is attacking when he is Angola. I mean, we know where he was. He was not in New Orleans. When he does get out of prison, he's actually chased out of New Orleans by a judge who says, if I find you in New Orleans again, I'm, I'm going to have you arrested. And he goes to California where he, he has a daughter living with her, with her grandparents. A man named Angelo Albano marries the widow of Mike Pepitone, Esther Pepitone. After they're married for a few months, her husband disappears. Albano and Mumphrey had known each other. They had actually been in business together. But Albano just simply disappears. And Esther says that Joseph Mumphrey shows up and says, if you don't give me money, I will do to you what I did to your husband. People interpret that in different ways. I think at the time he meant that he would kill her the way he killed her husband, Angelo, who had, who had disappeared. It might be interpreted that he meant her husband, Mike Pepitone, and it, it's possible that he was involved in the murder of Mike Pepitone, but I think it's unlikely because this was after when he had been run out of New Orleans. But he's threatening her. He says, if you don't give me money, I'm going to do to you what I did to your husband. She goes into her bedroom. She pulls out one revolver, empties that revolver into him, then goes and gets another revolver, empties that into him, including three shots in the back as he's trying to get away from her and get down the stairs. She pleads self-defense. And in 1921 in Los Angeles, she's acquitted for this murder. There's sort of an outline of truth in the version that Talent says. I think it is virtually impossible. Well, I think it is impossible for Mumphrey to have been the axe man. Esther Pepitone Albano never claims that she saw him kill her husband, Mike. She never claims that he's the axe man. She only claims that she shot him in self-defense because he threatened her. I mean, it's absolutely certain that he was in Louisiana prison at the time of some of these, some of these axe man attacks. If Joseph Mumphrey was not the axe man, is it possible then that there were later attacks that have not been connected to the axe man case? It's certainly possible that because during 1918, there was a series of axe man like burglaries. And I don't know if they were actually axe man or axe man attempts. Or if some of them were just, you know, in imitation of the axe man, um, you know, M.O., breaking into places in the dead of night. It could be exaggerations, for all I know, of people just scared by the axe man. The only ones I feel confident saying are axe man attacks that have not been known up until this time are ones that occur outside of New Orleans and elsewhere in Louisiana in 1920 and 1921. I think there are three Italian grocers who he attacks in the middle of the night, and he kills all three of them. So I think this is an example of how the attacks become more lethal over time. 
Do you think we will ever know the true identity of the Axeman? Well, I think probably not, but I have this, this hope that somebody will email me from Texas and say, you know, in 1922, my little town hanged a man who was found walking out of an Italian grocer's in three o'clock in the morning where he had just killed the grocer with his own ax. And if that ever happens, that's going to be my ax band. A big thank you to Miriam C. Davis for joining us on the show. Her book, which I highly recommend and is available on Amazon, is The Axeman of New Orleans, The True Story. You can also visit her website, axemanofneworleans.com, and she also has a Facebook page, which is The Axeman of New Orleans, The True Story. For more information about our special Halloween season offerings running this year from September 28th, to November 3rd, please visit our website, which is hauntedwalk.com. We'd love to connect with you on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all at Haunted Walk. And we are so close to our 50 five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts. Can you help us get over that final hurdle? One day left to do so. If you haven't written a review yet, it's a great time to do so. And hitting that 50 goal would just mean the world to our team. Speaking of our team, thank you to our audio editor, Michelle Dennis, and Jillian Walkerchuk, our expert guest wrangler. As always, thank you to Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com for the additional music. Until we meet again next week, sweet dreams. Sweet dreams.